teaching and growing together through the Bible. It's Today's Walk. Welcome to Today's Walk. I'm Kate Neighbors here with Pastor Roger Spradlin. Pastor Roger, we're going to be in the Old Testament today. We are. We're looking in Exodus chapter 16 where God used Moses in uh, the people being fed manna. I've been to that part of the world and all these people traveling uh, in the wilderness, they would have starved for sure <laughs> if it was not for God giving them manna to eat. Okay, well let's watch the bread of life. Now today, of course, is what we call Palm Sunday. It uh, begins the celebration of the last week or the week of passion of the Lord Jesus' life. It was on Sunday of that week that he entered Jerusalem in what we now call the triumphal entry. He rode a donkey down the steep uh, decline of the Mount of Olives and across the Kidron Valley into the eastern gate, not only of Jerusalem, but of the Temple uh, Mount area. And as he came into the city, people saw him coming, knew that he was entering the city, and they lined the streets, and they cheered for him, and they waved palm branches, and they, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. And they quoted a messianic psalm, blessed is he, they said, who comes in the name of the Lord. So many of the people were anticipating, and I think now believed, that Jesus was, in fact, the promised Messiah King. That was on Sunday morning. By Friday night of that week, Jesus was dead. I've been in Israel the last couple of weeks, and as we drove along through the desert, the Negev, as, as it's called geographically, I was reminded of how utterly desolate it is. The place that Jesus, or, or the Bible calls, the wilderness. And you know the story of how the children of Israel wandered in that wilderness, which is the Negev in Israel. It's the Sinai in uh, Egypt and uh, the, what was the Edom Empire, which is up in the mountains of southern Jordan and northern uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. It's completely desolate. And you know the story of how they complained. Well, I now have a new appreciation of their complaining. I mean, there is virtually no vegetation. We were there during the rainy season. Uh, but there's hardly any vegetation. There's hardly any animal life whatsoever. And you know the story of how the children of Israel were slaves for generations in Egypt, and God raised up a prophet by the name of Moses, and Moses went before the Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And the children of Israel left in what is called the Exodus, and it was a day of jubilation, celebration. They'd been born slaves. Their fathers, their grandfathers before them had been slaves. For the first time, they had a taste of freedom, and they, they gathered up their meager belongings and then some of the spoils that were given to them of Egypt, and they left, headed to the land of Israel, the promised land. You know what happened next. You've read it, or at least you've seen the movie, right? Moses prayed, and the Red Sea miraculously Parted. And they walked across as on dry land. They got to the other side. The Egyptian army pursued them. The waters collapsed and drowned their enemies. Now, as you remember, what should have taken only a few weeks in travel from Egypt to Israel actually took 40 years. It was because of their disobedience to God that it took so long. It didn't start out that way. After they crossed the Red Sea, it was, a, it was a great worship service, one of the greatest worship services recorded in all the Bible. Miriam, the sister of Moses, led in this great time of worship. They sang, they danced, they praised God for their deliverance. And then after that, they came to a place that they named Mara, which in Hebrew means bitter. It's because the water was not drinkable. It was bitter, and they complained because they, they had no water. Now, here's a group of people that have just witnessed the greatest aquatic miracle of all time. They knew that God had a way with water, right? The Red Sea had parted, and yet they complained. God provided water for them. And then they came to a place called 
Elam. It was a beautiful, beautiful oasis in the wilderness. But the passage that we look at, at today out of Exodus chapter 16 is in the wilderness of Zin. Six weeks have gone by since their deliverance and since the exodus, and now reality has begun to set in. They were between the oasis of Elam and Sinai where the law of God was given to them, where God spoke to them. They were living in the twilight between redemption and the promised land. And that's where we live our life. We, we've been redeemed if you're a Christian. We, we, we've been saved. That's the nomenclature of the Bible. But we're not yet in heaven, right? And so we live on this earth in between uh, our, our salvation, our justification, and the consummation of our salvation in heaven. And what happened to them is they began to complain. Let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day, the second month, after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now you would think that if you were there, if you would have seen the Red Sea part, if you would have been born a slave and now you are free, you would think, I'm never going to complain again. Not so. They complained. Here's the first principle. Complaining is a result of a wrong focus in life. I think probably they had unrealistic expectations. that Maybe they thought magically we're just going to leave Egypt and we're going to arrive in the promised land. There'll be no hardships. We'll never get thirsty. We'll never be hungry. There'll be no dust storms in the desert. We may not even sweat. There's some Christians think that. They bought into the prosperity gospel that if you really love Jesus you'll be rich. That if you really love Jesus, you'll never be sick. And then problems come and you feel betrayed and you're angry at God because you had the wrong perspective to start with. We are not exempt from difficult. We're not exempt from the deserts of life. And they complained. And it wasn't just them. We're kind of wired that way in our human nature. Even in the New Testament, after the day of Pentecost and Peter preached and 3,000 were saved and you had the birth of the church, it was just a short time later that the church was complaining. There were those that complained uh, that, the, that the Jewish women were not treated as well as the Grecians, and they were treated better, and this group is treated better, and we're treated worse, and they complained. We complain because our focus is on ourselves. We went our way. We went our preferences. They remembered what they should have forgot, and they forgot what they should have remembered. Verse number three. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Are you kidding me? They forgot about the slavery. They said, oh, we had it so good in Egypt. We had so much meat. Really? I mean, if we know anything about the ancient world, meat was a scarcity because of the lack of refrigeration. And, and we know anything about slavery in the ancient world, that there was always this gnawing sense of hunger. But they said, oh, we, we ate our bread to the full. We never needed anything. There's a parallel passage in Numbers chapter 11, verse number 4. Now the mixed multitude who were among them, this is the people that went out from Egypt that were not the Hebrew people, but went with them. They yielded intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. I mean, it's if they're pounding the table with Moses and Aaron saying, give us onions, give us garlic. We have a saying in this culture, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, onions and garlic keeps everyone away. <laughs> they were saying, we would rather be dead than not fed. When our focus is upon the past, we end up complaining. 
We tend to glamorize the past. That's what they're doing. They, they were slaves, and yet they're glamorizing the days of slavery. And sometimes we, we look at the past and we become nostalgic and we talk about the good old days. If we could just go back, if we could go back, we would remember then they weren't quite as good as what we thought they were. When we focus on the past, we end up complaining. When we compare like they were doing, we end up complaining. They said, oh, we had it so good in Egypt. They'd forgot about the sting of the whip. They'd forgot about laboring from dawn until dusk, making up bricks. They'd forgot about the murderous tyrant of, of Pharaoh. There's a proverbial saying that I complained that I had no shoes until I saw a man that had no feet. There was no sense of gratitude. They had been delivered out of Egypt. The Red Sea is parted for them. And there's no expression of gratitude. Gratitude is the soil that faith grows in. They thought, and we think sometimes, well, complaining is not that bad. It's not like stealing. It's not like lying. It's not like adultery. It's not like murder. What does it hurt if I complain? Well, first of all, it hurts yourself. You become angry. You become bitter. That becomes your focus. You become cynical. My observation in life is that complainers are not happy people. Worse than that, our complaining is an insult to God. You are saying to God, I am not pleased with your providence. I'm not pleased with your provision. I'm not pleased with what you're doing within my life. We're, we're like a little kid or a little child that's given candy, and then we want more, more, more. Our complaining reveals a discontent that is rooted in selfishness, not faith. But the next principle is this. God allows our faith to be tested. The big test for them, I think, was the Red Sea. The Red Sea parts, the water is walled up, and Moses says, come on, follow me. And you look at all that water, and you've got a choice to make. Am I going to respond in faith or fear? Are we going to trust God? And most of us would say that we're a Christian. We have trusted God. We trust God with our soul. But we don't always trust Him with the details of our life. And that's where God tests us. He tests us in the routine of life, sometimes with illness, sometimes with our finances, sometimes with relationships, even broken relationships. They expected, or I think they expected, to just make a beeline to the promised land. You know, just be a few weeks and then we're there. Why didn't it happen that way? Well, one thing for sure is because of their disobedience. But it was more than that that was going on. Listen to what Deuteronomy 8 says, and we're going to flash forward some 40 years. This is 40 years after the events that we're looking at today. Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the purpose. To humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. It's the adversity of life that stretches our faith sometimes. The roots of a tree must grow deeper in a strong wind. Now, what was their test? Their test was hunger. They're in this wilderness. It's just absolutely a desolate place. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Will God provide? We're God guide. Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. Well, what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Aaron said it, Moses said it, when we complain, ultimately it stops at God's desk. Our complaints in life are against God and his sovereignty and his provision. 
But there's something interesting that I notice in this passage. It says, on the sixth day, you gather twice as much. We would say, well, of course, that's for the Sabbath. You're not to work on the Sabbath, so they gather twice as much on the sixth day because there's not going to be this provision of bread on the seventh day. But wait a minute. Remember the context. They have not come to Mount Sinai yet. The Ten Commandments have not been given. No one has ever heard of keeping the Sabbath yet. That was given later on the mountain by God to Moses. And so what God is saying to them, listen, if I provide for you, will you give me a day of worship? He's, he's not asking much. I, if I provide, will you slow down one day to worship me? Here's the next principle. God's provision goes beyond our needs. It says in verse number four that I, God says, I will rain bread from heaven. But then he also says, I will give you meat. Verse 11, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I've heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And so it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay all around the camp. God not only gave them bread, but he gave them meat. He gave them quail. Verse 14. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those uh, uh, who are in his tent. What is it, they said? This, this little substance was, was on the ground. They said, what is it? You know, the Hebrew word that translates that sentence, what is it, is manhu. We would say manna. What is it? They never even named it. They just called it, what is it? <laughs> that God provided, provided, what is it? Manna. And they just picked it up. And it was bread. The rabbis have a tradition of saying that manna tasted like whatever your favorite food is. I don't know, maybe it was angel food cake. I don't know. We don't know. And you say, well, God doesn't provide miraculously for me. I don't have bread that I pick up in my backyard. Well, somewhere there's a farmer that plants a seed. And the sun that the Son of God created warms the earth where the seed germinates. And the rain that the Father causes falls. And the petroleum that was made out of fossils that God provided under pressure millenniums ago fuels my wife's car and she goes to the store and gets bread and brings it home. <laughs> it is still God's provision. Whether it's supernatural or natural, it is God who provides. Now there's some scholars that go to great lengths to try to explain away the miraculous nature of God's provision. And they say, well, the quails were explained by migration of the birds. And there's some basis, in fact, in that. When we were in Israel, we, we saw a uh, huge flock of storks that were, they were migrating from North Africa to Europe, as they do every year. And in fact, there's millions of birds of various species that migrate over Israel from Africa to, uh, to, to Europe. And we know this also, that there are quail that fly across the Mediterranean from the Greek islands and they reach the shores of Israel and they're totally exhausted. They're easily caught. You can even pick them up off the ground. Uh, you can watch that on YouTube if you'd like to. <laughs> but here's the miracle. It's a miracle of perfect timing that when Moses prayed, those quails showed up and they showed up right in the camp itself. And the man who, the manna, Scholars have said, well, there's a certain plant lice that eats the tamarisk tree that grows in the wilderness and it exudes a white substance that tastes like honey. And that was the man. Well, they were amazingly religious bugs because they didn't produce it on the Sabbath later on. <laughs> you see, unbelief is more ingenious than belief. God provides. 
At times he does it supernaturally. At times he does it naturally. But it is still God who's in charge of our world. But here's the last principle and by far the most important. The ultimate bread of life is Jesus. There's a rabbinic, there was a rabbinic tradition that when Messiah comes, that he would provide bread, just as Moses provided bread in the wilderness, or God did through Moses. Then when Messiah comes, he will bring that kind of provision, he'll bring bread with him. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Beth, house, Lechem, bread. He was born in the house of bread. In John 6, he fed the multitude of 5,000 men. And the next day, the crowd, were they were looking for him. Let's pick up the story in, in John chapter 6 and verse number 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they, the Sea of Galilee, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs or the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You're you, you want me because of what I give you, the bread. But then he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. He's using the metaphor of, of spiritual nourishment, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. And they go on and they, they ask the question of, uh, of Jesus about how that... Uh, you know, Moses provided manna in the desert. What sign will you do? And, and Jesus answered in verse 31, our, they said, our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and I come down from heaven. No prophet had ever said that. No prophet had ever indicated that they existed in heaven and that they came down from heaven. No prophet ever claimed pre-existence, but Jesus did. Jesus no more began in Bethlehem than he ended at Calvary. He became incarnate. He took on human flesh at Bethlehem. But he's always been. He is the eternal son of God. He says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now manna in the Old Testament is the ultimate symbol, I think, of grace. I mean, they didn't work for it. It was just there. They didn't grind the flour. They didn't knead the dough. It was just given to them. And our salvation, our rightness with God is a gift. And Jesus is saying, I am that gift. Salvation is not simply a plan. It is a person. Salvation is Jesus. And he said, I am the bread of life. He's using this extended metaphor uh, that that he is the one that satisfies. It was the same kind of metaphor he used for the woman at the well in Shechem in Samaria. And he said, I will give you living water and you'll never thirst again. He's saying that within every human being, there's this spiritual thirst and only he can slate it. There is this spiritual hunger. There is an emptiness. And he's the only one that can fill it. And it's true. There is within humanity this whole an emptiness. People that have everything that our culture has to offer, many times they still feel so empty and they try to fill it with so much stuff, so much activity, riches, sex, drugs, all kinds of things, and yet there's a lack of satisfaction. There's an emptiness because that hole is shaped like Jesus. Even in a primitive culture, maybe in an Amazon basin in a jungle, there'll be someone that will take a club and they'll club an animal. They'll build a fire and they'll eat its flesh. And then they'll take that club and they'll carve an image and they'll bow down and worship it. 
Because there's this innate desire within us to want to connect to God. There's this hole, but it's shaped like Jesus. That was a wonderful message, uh, the bread of life. Pastor Roger, it, it's interesting in one of Jesus' most famous sermons that he references this story in Exodus. He, he does. He is in the city of Capernaum, and he's in the synagogue. And the day before, he had uh, fed the multitudes, broke the bread and the fish and distributed it. And the people kind of tied that together of how Moses uh, had manna in the wilderness, mm -hmm. and he's in this barren wilderness area and feeds the multitude. But then Jesus makes an amazing statement to them. He said, I am the bread of life. Mm. Uh, th that's in John chapter 6. And what he's saying is that I am the one that meets your needs. Mm. And it's not just physical needs. Right. But he's saying, I am the one that gives you purpose in life. I am the one that provides forgiveness. I'm the one that can provide fulfillment within mm. your life. And in large part, they didn't completely comprehend it. And our culture doesn't completely comprehend it. We... Our culture thinks that fulfillment is uh, in the pursuit of other interests or the pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. and uh, through all kinds of addictions and all kinds of things that God says is wrong. But actually our fulfillment comes when we yield our life to Jesus and He becomes the bread of life that satisfies those deepest longings that we have. Mm. We all know what it feels like to be hungry. Yeah. But sometimes I think we forget what it feels like to be spiritually hungry. And maybe you're watching today and you're listening to this amazing message and you're listening to the things that Pastor Roger has to say and you realize you're hungry. Not something that you can get from food, but only from Christ. There's a number at the bottom of the screen, and there are people who want to pray with you. They want to talk to you. They want to answer your questions, <laughs> help you realize that Jesus is the ultimate bread of life. You simply have to call. Pastor Roger, thank you so much. I love when we get to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament come together. Right. It just makes uh, the Bible come alive. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Good. Thank you. If you'd like a free copy of today's message or any of the messages from today's Walk Broadcast Ministry, you can call the number. You can write to us. Find us on Facebook, todayswalk.org. Either way, join us next week for more sound biblical teaching. This has been Today's Walk. Today's Walk is a broadcast ministry of Valley Baptist Church. This program is supported directly by our church members and by viewers like you. You'll find plenty of great resources when you call us or visit our website. Thanks for watching and join us again next week at the same time for Today's Walk from Valley Baptist Church in Bakersfield, California.